Prince Roman by Joseph Conrad Based upon the story of Prince Roman Sengaski of Poland, 1800-1881 Read by Donald Miller Events which happened 70 years ago are perhaps rather too far off to be dragged aptly into a mere conversation. Of course, the year 1831 is for us an historical date, one of those fatal years when in the presence of the world's passive indignation and eloquent sympathies we had once more to murmur, vo victus, and count the cost and sorrow. Not that we were ever very good at calculating either, in prosperity or in adversity. That's a lesson we could never learn, to the great exasperation of our enemies who have bestowed upon us the epithet of incorrigible. The speaker was of Polish nationality, that nationality not so much alive as surviving, which persists in thinking, breathing, speaking, hoping, and suffering in its grave, railed in by a million of bayonets and triple sealed with the seals of three great empires. The conversation was about aristocracy. How did this, nowadays, discredited subject come up? It is some years ago now, and the precise recollection has faded, but I remember that it was not considered practically as an ingredient in the social mixture and I verily believe that we arrived at the subject through some exchange of ideas about patriotism, a somewhat discredited sentiment, because the delicacy of our humanitarians regards it as a relic of barbarism. Yet neither the great Florentine painter who closed his eyes in death thinking of his city nor St. Francis, blessing with his last breath the town of Assisi, were barbarians. It requires a certain greatness of soul to interpret patriotism worthily, or else a sincerity of feeling denied to the vulgar refinement of modern thought, which cannot understand the august simplicity of a sentiment proceeding from the very nature of things and men. The aristocracy we were talking about was the very highest, the great families of Europe, not impoverished, not converted, not liberalized, the most distinctive and specialized class of all classes, for which even ambition itself does not exist among the usual incentives of activity and regulators of conduct. The undisputed right of leadership having passed away from them, we judged that their great fortunes, their cosmopolitanism, brought about by wide alliances their elevated station, in which there is so little to gain and so much to lose, must make their position difficult in times of political commotion or national upheaval. No longer born to command, which is the very essence of aristocracy. It becomes difficult for them to do aught else but hold aloof from the great movements of popular passion. We had reached that conclusion when the remark about far-off events was made and the date of 1831 mentioned, and the speaker continued. I don't mean to say that I knew Prince Roman at that time. I begin to feel pretty ancient, but I am not so ancient as that. In fact, Prince Roman was married the very year my father was born. It was in 1828. The 19th century was young yet, and the prince was even younger than the century. But I don't know exactly by how much. In any case, his was an early marriage. It was an ideal alliance from every point of view. The girl was young and beautiful, an orphan heiress of a great name and of a great fortune. The prince, then an officer in the guards and distinguished amongst his fellows by something reserved and reflective in his character, 
had fallen headlong in love with her beauty, her charm, and the serious qualities of her mind and heart. He was a rather silent young man, but his glances, his bearing, his whole person expressed his absolute devotion to the woman of his choice, a devotion which she returned in her own frank and fascinating manner. The flame of this pure young passion promised to burn forever, and for a season it lit up the dry, cynical atmosphere of the great world of St. Petersburg. The Emperor Nicholas himself, the grandfather of the present man, the one who died from the Crimean War, the last perhaps of the autocrats with a mystical belief in the divine character of his mission, showed some interest in this pair of married lovers. It is true that Nicholas kept a watchful eye on all the doings of the great Polish nobles. The young people, leading a life appropriate to their station, were obviously wrapped up in each other and society, fascinated by the sincerity of a feeling moving serenely among the artificialities of its anxious and fastidious agitation, watched them with benevolent indulgence and an amused tenderness. The marriage was the social event of 1828 in the capital. Just forty years afterwards, I was staying in the country house of my mother's brother in our southern provinces. It was the dead of winter. The great lawn in front was as pure and smooth as an alpine snowfield, a white and feathery level sparkling under the sun as if sprinkled with diamond dust declining gently to the lake, a long sinuous piece of frozen water looking bluish and more solid than the earth. A cold, brilliant sun glided low above an undulating horizon of great folds of snow in which the villages of Ukraine peasants remained out of sight like clusters of boats hidden in the hollows of a running sea, and everything was very still. I don't know now how I managed to escape at eleven o'clock in the morning from the schoolroom. I was a boy of eight, the little girl, my cousin, a few months younger than myself, though hereditarily more quick-tempered, was less adventurous. So I had escaped alone, and presently I found myself in the great stone-paved hall, warmed by a monumental stove of white tiles, a much more pleasant locality than the schoolroom, which for some reason or other, perhaps hygienic, was always kept at a low temperature. We children were aware that there was a guest staying in the house. He had arrived the night before, just as we were being driven off to bed. We broke back through the line of beaters to rush and flatten our noses against the dark window panes, but we were too late to see him alight. We had only watched in a ruddy glare the big traveling carriage on sleigh runners harnessed with six horses, a black mass against the snow going off to the stables, preceded by a horseman carrying a blazing ball of tow and resin in an iron basket at the end of a long stick swung from his saddle bow. Two stable boys had been sent out early in the afternoon along the snow tracks to meet the expected guest at dusk and light his way with these road torches. At that time, you must remember, there was not a single mile of railways in our southern provinces. My little cousin and I had no knowledge of trains and engines, except from picture books, as of things rather vague, extremely remote, and not particularly interesting unless to grown-ups who traveled abroad. Our notion of princes, perhaps a little more precise, was mainly literary and had a glamour reflected from the light of fairy tales, in which princes always appear young, charming, heroic, and fortunate. 
Yet, as well as any other children, we could draw a firm line between the real and the ideal. We knew that princes were historical personages, and there was some glamour in that fact, too. But what had driven me to roam cautiously over the house, like an escaped prisoner, was the hope of snatching an interview with a special friend of mine, the head forester who generally came to make his report at that time of the day. I yearned for news of a certain wolf. You know, in a country where wolves are to be found, every winter almost brings forward an individual eminent by the audacity of his misdeeds, by his more perfect wolfishness, so to speak. I wanted to hear some new thrilling tale of that wolf, perhaps the dramatic story of his death. But there was no one in the hall. Deceived in my hopes, I became suddenly very much depressed. Unable to slip back in triumph to my studies, I elected to stroll spiritlessly into the billiard room, where I certainly had no business. There was no one there either, and I felt very lost and desolate under its high ceiling, all alone, with the massive English billiard table which seemed, in heavy rectilinear silence, to disapprove of that small boy's intrusion. As I began to think of retreat, I heard footsteps in the adjoining drawing-room, and before I could turn tail and flee, my uncle and his guest appeared in the doorway. To run away after having been seen would have been highly improper, so I stood my ground. My uncle looked surprised to see me. The guest by his side was a spare man, of average stature, buttoned up in a black frock coat, and holding himself very erect with a stiffly soldier-like carriage. From the folds of a soft white cambric neckcloth peeped the points of a collar, close against each shaven cheek. A few wisps of thin gray hair were brushed smoothly across the top of his bald head. His face, which must have been beautiful in its day, had preserved in age the harmonious simplicity of its lines. What amazed me was its even, almost death-like pallor. He seemed to me to be prodigiously old. A faint smile, a mere momentary alteration in the set of his thin lips, acknowledged my blushing confusion and I became greatly interested to see him reach into the inside breast pocket of his coat. He extracted therefrom a lead pencil and a block of detachable pages, which he handed to my uncle with an almost imperceptible bow. I was very much astonished, but my uncle received it as a matter of course. He wrote something at which the other glanced and nodded slightly. A thin, wrinkled hand the hand was older than the face, patted my cheek and then rested on my head lightly. An unringing voice, a voice as colorless as the face itself, issued from his sunken lips, while the eyes, dark and still, looked down at me kindly. And how old is this shy little boy? Before I could answer, my uncle wrote down my age on the pad. I was very impressed. What was this ceremony? Was this personage too great to be spoken to? Again he glanced at the pad, and again gave a nod, and again that impersonal mechanical voice was heard. He resembles his grandfather. I remember my paternal grandfather. He had died not long before. He too was prodigiously old and to me it seemed perfectly natural that to such ancient and venerable persons should have known each other in the dim ages of creation before my birth. But my uncle obviously had not been aware of the fact, so obviously that the mechanical voice explained, Yes, yes, comrades, and thirty-one, he was one of those who knew, Old times, my dear sir, old times.
He made a gesture as if to put aside an important ghost, and now they were both looking down at me. I wondered whether anything was expected from me. To my round, questioning eyes, my uncle remarked, He's completely deaf, and the unrelated, inexpressive voice said, Give me your hand. Acutely conscious of inky fingers, I put it out timidly. I had never seen a deaf person before, and was rather startled. He pressed it firmly, and then gave me a final pat on the head. My uncle addressed me weightily. You have shaken hands with Prince Roman S. It's something for you to remember when you grow up. I was impressed by his tone. I had enough historical information to know vaguely that the Prince's S counted amongst the sovereign princes of Ruthenia till the union of all Ruthenian lands to the Kingdom of Poland, when they became great Polish magnates sometimes at the beginning of the 15th century. But what concerned me most was the failure of the fairy tale glamour. It was shocking to discover a prince who was deaf, bald, meager, and so prodigiously old. It never occurred to me that this imposing and disappointing man had been young, rich, beautiful. I could not know that he had been happy in the felicity of an ideal marriage, uniting two young hearts, two great names, and two great fortunes, happy with a happiness which, as in fairy tales, seemed destined to last forever. But it did not last forever. It was fated not to last very long, even by the measure of the days allotted to men's passage on this earth, where enduring happiness is only found in the conclusion of fairy tales. A daughter was born to them, and shortly afterwards the health of the young princess began to fail. For a time she bore up with smiling intrepidity, sustained by the feeling that now her existence was necessary for the happiness of two lives. But at last the husband, thoroughly alarmed by the rapid changes in her appearance, obtained an unlimited leave and took her away from the capital to his parents in the country. The old prince and princess were extremely frightened at the state of their beloved daughter-in-law. Preparations were at once made for a journey abroad, but it seemed as it were already too late, and the invalid herself opposed the project with gentle obstinacy. Thin and pale in the great armchair, where the insidious and obscure nervous malady made her appear smaller and more frail every day, without effacing the smile of her eyes or the charming grace of her wasted face, she clung to her native land and wished to breathe her native air. Nowhere else could she expect to get well so quickly. Nowhere else would it be so easy for her to die. She died before her little girl was two years old. The grief of the husband was terrible and the more alarming to his parents because perfectly silent and dry-eyed. After the funeral, while the immense bareheaded crowd of peasants surrounding the private chapel on the grounds was dispersed, the prince, waving away his friends and relations, remained alone to watch the masons of the estate closing the family vault. When the last stone was in position, he uttered a groan, the first sound of pain which had escaped from him for days, and walking away with lowered head, shut himself up again in his apartments. His father and mother feared for his reason. His outward tranquility was appalling to them. They had nothing to trust but to that very youth which made his despair so self-absorbed and so intense. Old Prince John, fretful and anxious, repeated, Poor Roman should be roused somehow. He's so young. But they could find nothing to rouse him with. And the old princess, wiping her eyes,
wished in her heart he were young enough to come and cry at her knee. In time, Prince Roman, making an effort, would join now and again the family circle, but it was as if his heart and his mind had been buried in the family vault with the wife he had lost. He took to wandering in the woods with a gun, watched over secretly by one of the keepers who would report in the evening that his serenity has never fired a shot all day. Sometimes walking to the stables in the morning he would order in subdued tones a horse to be saddled, wait switching his boot till it was led up to him, then mount without a word and ride out of the gates at a walking pace. He would be gone all day. People saw him on the roads, looking neither to the left nor to the right. White-faced, sitting rigidly in the saddle like a horseman of stone on a living mount. The peasants working in the fields, the great unhedged fields, looked after him from the distance, and sometimes some sympathetic old woman on the threshold of a low, thatched hut was moved to make the sign of the cross in the air behind his back, as though he were one of themselves, a simple village soul struck by a sore affliction. He rode, looking straight ahead, seeing no one, as if the earth were empty, and all mankind buried in that grave which had opened so suddenly in his path to swallow up his happiness. What were men to him with their sorrows, joys, labors, and passions, from which she who had been all the world to him had been cut off so early? They did not exist, and he would have felt as completely lonely and abandoned as a man in the toils of a cruel nightmare if it had not been for this countryside where he had been born and had spent his happy boyish years. He knew it well, every slight rise crowned with trees amongst the ploughed fields, every dell concealing a village, the damned streams made a chain of lakes set in the green meadows. Far away to the north, the great Lithuanian forest faced the sun, no higher than a hedge, and to the south, the way to the plains, the vast brown spaces of the earth touched the blue sky. And this familiar landscape associated with the days without thought and without sorrow, this land, the charm of which he felt without even looking at it, soothed his pain like the presence of an old friend who sits silent and disregarded by one in some dark hour of life. One afternoon it happened that the prince, after turning his horse's head for home, remarked a low, dense cloud of dark dust cutting off slantwise a part of the view. He reined in on a knoll and peered. There were slender gleams of steel here and there in that cloud, and it contained moving forms which revealed themselves at last as a long line of peasant carts full of soldiers moving slowly and double file under the escort of mounted Cossacks. It was like an immense reptile creeping over the fields, its head dipped out of sight in a slight hollow, and its tail went on writhing and growing shorter, as though the monster were eating its way slowly into the very heart of the land. The prince directed his way through a village lying a little off the track, the roadside inn, with its stable, byre, and barn, under one enormous thatched roof, resembled a deformed hunchback, ragged, giant, sprawling amongst the small huts of the peasants. The innkeeper, a portly, dignified Jew, clad in a black satin coat, reaching down to his heels, and girt with a red sash, stood at the door, stroking his long silvery beard. He watched the prince approach, and bowed gravely from the waist, not expecting to be noticed even, since it was well known that their young lord had no eyes for anything or anybody in his grief. 
It was quite a shock for him when the prince pulled up and asked, What's all this, Yankel? That is, please your serenity, that is, a convoy of foot soldiers they are hurrying down to the south. He glanced right and left cautiously, but as there was no one near but some children playing in the dust of the village street, he came up close to the stirrup. Doesn't your serenity know? It has begun already down there. All the landowners, great and small, are out in arms, and even the common people have risen. Only yesterday, the saddler from Gradec, it was a tiny market town nearby, went through here with two apprentices on his way to join. He left even his cart with me. I gave him a guide through our neighborhood. You know your serenity. Our people, they travel a lot, and they see all that's going on, and they know all the roads.'